integrated problem number three. So we're going to look at this, and you can see that there's three big questions here. So we're going to take a second and break each one of these down and look at this question and this question and finally this bottom question <coughs> individually. So let's look at this first major question. So naturally occurring chlorine is composed of two isotopes, 75.76% chlorine-35, that has a mass of 34.9688 AMUs and 24.46% chlorine 37 that has a mass of 36.9659 AMUs. As well, naturally occurring oxygen is composed of three isotopes, chlorine oxygen 16, which is 99.757%, chlorine 17, which is 0.038%, and chlorine 18, which is 0 0.025 percent, and we see that we have the mass of the oxygen and the of oxygen 16 and the mass of oxygen 17, but we do not yet have the mass of the oxygen 18. <clears throat> so a compound Cl2O is formed from these isotopes. So the first question is, what is the name of this Cl2O? Right, the first thing we have to recognize when naming is whether this is what kind of compound this is. Is it ionic or is it molecular? If we look at the periodic table, we see that both chlorine and oxygen are nonmetals, so that makes this a molecular compound. So this is molecular. So we're going to name it as a molecular compound. <coughs> Remember, for those, we name we have to include not only the name of each atom, but also the number of those present. <clears throat> so if we look at Cl2, that, that's chlorine. So this is going to be chlorine. There's two of them, so we have to call this dichlorine. And then the oxygen, we change the ending to ide include the number, which is one, monoxide. So this name of this compound is dichlorine monoxide. <clears throat> the next question <coughs> is based on these isotopic possibilities, the two isotopes for chlorine and the three ox isotopes for oxygen, how many different molecules with different masses can actually exist, right? <coughs> so we can look at that. If we just change the chlorine, so we can have both chlorines with chlorine 35, right? That gives us, and one of the oxygens, right? So both chlorines are 35, then we can have three different possibilities based on the oxygen. We can have oxygen 16. We can have a compound that's chlorine 35 and an oxygen 17, and a chlorine 35 and an oxygen 18. Right. Similarly, we can have compounds that only have chlorine 37 chlorines, and then the three possibilities for the oxygen, 17, 16, 17, and 18. <clears throat> that gives us a total of six. But what there, since there's two chlorines here, we can also have a set of molecules where we have 135 and 137. So we can have a molecule that has a chlorine 35, an oxygen 16, and a chlorine 37. Right? We can have a molecule that has a chlorine 35, an oxygen 17, and a chlorine 37. And a third one where we have a chlorine 35, an oxygen 18, and a chlorine 37. Right. So those are all the different possibilities we can have based on those number of isotopes. So we count those up. There are a total of 
nine different possibilities. <coughs> if we look at the next question, calculate the average atomic mass of chlorine. Right? When we talk about the average atomic mass, we're talking about a weighted average. So this average mass is going to be equal to the sum of the abundances as a decimal times the mass in AMUs. Right? So for the chlorine thir or for the chlorine, we have this is going to equal the abundance of the chlorine 35 as a decimal. So this is going to be 0 0.7576. So we take the percentage divided by 100 times its mass, which is 34.9688 AMUs, plus the abundance of the chlorine 37, 0 0.2424, times its mass, 36.9659 AMUs. Right? So we multiply the abundance as a decimal times its mass and, and add those all up. And we see <clears throat> that for this one, we get <coughs> a average atomic mass of um, 35.45. Which, if we look on the periodic table for chlorine, the atomic mass listed there is 35.45. Again, the number listed here is this weighted average. Okay. We can do something similar in this next question where we're looking to calculate the mass of the oxygen 18. We're still going to use this formula where the average mass is equal to the sum of each individual mass times its abundance. But now... We know that the overall mass should be 16 from the periodic table. So that's going to give us 16.00 AMUs is going to equal the abundance of each oxygen times its mass. So for the first one, it's 0 0.99. 757 times that mass, which is 15.9949 AMUs, plus the next one, 0 0.0038.038 0 .038 divided by 100, times its mass, which was 16.9991 plus the abundance of the 18 times its mass. So 0 0.00205 times x, some mass that we're trying to solve for. So we're taking the abundance as a decimal times by the mass for each one, add those together, we get the mass on the periodic table. One of them is an unknown x. <coughs> So if we do that, <coughs> we multiply these two numbers together, multiply these two numbers together, add those two together, we get, and then subtract that over, we can simplify this into 0 0.0375 is equal to 0 0.00205x. Again, divide that over we get a mass x equal to 18.296 AMU. Right, so we're still using the same formula, the average. Now our unknown isn't the average mass, it's actually one of the individual masses in the problem. So now that we have these two, excuse me, all of these atomic masses, isotopic masses up here, we can answer this next question, which is 
for each mass, get each of the given mass, or give the masses for each of these Cl2O molecules. Right? <clears throat> so if we look at that, we're going to have nine different masses. We're going to have the 35 Cl2O16, the 35 Cl2O17, the 35 Cl2O18, the 37 Cl2O16, the 37 Cl2O17 oxygen, and the 37 Cl's plus the 18 oxygen. And then the ones where they're combined, 35 Cl, 16 O, 37 Cl, 35 Cl, 17 O, 37 Cl, and 35 Cl, 18 O, 37 Cl. <clears throat> so then we have to take all of the masses that we calculated from up here. <clears throat> so for this first one, the sum of the masses is going to be 2 times the mass of chlorine 35, which from above was 34.9688 AMUs, plus the oxygen 16 mass, which was 15.9949 AMUs, to give a total mass of 85.9325. And we're just going to continue this down. 2 times the mass of 35 plus the oxygen 17. 16.9991 gives us 86.9367. Two times the 35 again. Now the oxygen 18 we just calculated, which is 18.296 AMUs, which would give us a total of 88.2336 AMU. <clears throat> and we're just going to continue that process for all of these. <clears throat> so for the chlorine 37, we're going to take 2 times the mass of chlorine 37, which is 36.9659, and add it to the oxygen 16. which is 89.9267 AMUs. <coughs> Again, oxygen 17. Give a mass of 90.9309 AMU. And finally, for this group, 9... Six five nine mass of oxygen eighteen eighteen point two nine six is equal to ninety two point two two seven eight AMU. <coughs> and then for the mixed ones, we have one oxygen or chlorine thirty thirty five. plus the oxygen 16, plus the oxygen 37, or chlorine 37, excuse me, 36.9659, which gives us a mass of 87.9296, and repeat for the other equal 
to 88.9338. And the last one, 34.9688 plus 18.296. Plus 36.9659. And the last one is 90.2307 AMUs. <clears throat> so, based on this isotopic composition, we can have a mass of the C2O anywhere from 85.9 all the way up to 92.2278. Right, so this range is going to be considered, we don't usually talk about the individual ranges because we're using the average atomic masses, which means that we would be calculating an average molecular mass. Right? Because we don't necessarily know the composition at any one time, we're going to stick to the average values off the periodic table. Let's look at the next one. <coughs> Most fertilizer consists of a nitrogen-containing compound such as NH3, NH4, NO3, or NH4, 2, SO4. The nitrogen content of these compounds is used for protein synthesis by plants. So plants are going to use the nitrogen in these fertilizers to synthesize proteins, and the most common ones are those. Right. <clears throat> so let's look at these. And first, let's classify these compounds. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to look. We have the three different compounds, NH3, NH4, NO3, and NH4, parentheses 2, SO4. Right. And we're going to classify these. <coughs> Just like before, we're going to look at either ionic or covalent based on where they are on the periodic table. Notice on this periodic table, hydrogen is also white. Right? So we can typically consider hydrogen as having properties just like the nonmetals. So if we have nitrogen and hydrogen, we're going to call that nonmetal nonmetal bonding, which makes this compound covalent. So we're going to call this a covalent compound. <coughs> if we look at the next one, NH4NO3, we have these two pieces memorized as polyatomics. Right? The NH4 plus is NH4 is a positive one ion. So and the NO3 is a minus one ion. So this is going to be, because those two are polyatomic ions combined, this is going to be an ionic compound. Again, same thing with this bottom one. We have SO4, which is typically a 2 minus, and we have two of the NH4s, which are pluses. So this is also an ionic compound. So we have one ion covalent, two ionic. <coughs> so that would be number one. If we look at number two, we want to name each one of these compounds. Right. <coughs> so NH3, we can name it as the IUPAC name, which would be nitrogen, then three hydrogen, so trihydride. Right. Or more commonly, we refer to this as its common name of ammonia. So while we can name it this, typically we're going to stick with this name, this common name, ammonia. Right? Here for these ionic compounds, remember we name the anion first, or the, excuse me, the cation first, then the anion. So NH4 is the ammonium, ammonia, excuse me, ammonium, 
and NO3 is nitrate. Again, we don't have to worry about how many they are because the number is going to be dictated by their charge balance. So this is ammonium nitrate. This last one, again, we name the cation first, ammonium, and then this anion second, this is the sulfate. Again, these polyatomic ions, we're just going to have to memorize what those are, both as far as their name and their formula and respective charges. Okay. <coughs> Next, let's calculate for number three, the mass percent, or the percent by mass composition of nitrogen in each of these compounds. So this is going to be the mass of nitrogen divided by the total mass times 100. Right. So for the NH3, we have one nitrogen So it has a mass of nitrogen in this one, one times its mass, which is 14.01, off the periodic table, AMUs, divided by the total mass, which is going to be the mass of nitrogen, plus three times the mass of hydrogen, again, off the periodic table, it's 1.008. Right. <clears throat> this whole mass... So we take 14 divided by 14 times, 14 plus 3 times 1.008 times 100 gives us a value of 82.25%. We can do something similar for the NH4NO3 and something similar for the NH42SO4. For this one, <coughs> the ammonium nitrate, now we have two nitrogens. So the mass percent is going to be two times the mass of nitrogen divided by, again, this whole mass here, or this whole mass here. Two times the mass of nitrogen plus four times the mass of hydrogen, plus three times the mass of oxygen. In the periodic table, that is 16 times 100. We get a percent by mass of 35.00%. And repeat this process for the next one. Again, now we have two ammonium groups, so we still have two hydrogens, or nitrogens, excuse me, divided by the total mass, which is two times the, the mass of nitrogen, plus now we have eight times the mass of hydrogen, plus the mass of one times the mass of the sulfur, which is 32.06, plus four times the mass of oxygen, which again is 16, times 100. So when we do that math, we end up with 21.20%. So this percent by mass, we take the mass of whatever element we're talking about, divided by the total mass times 100 to make it a percent. The last question of this part is which fertilizer has the highest nitrogen content? We can look here at these. We see if this is a measure of nitrogen per total, then we see that this first one the NH3 has the largest mass highest nitrogen content. The ammonia Now let's look at this one last problem. So iodine, the iodine ion 
is a dietary mineral essential for good nutrition. In countries where potassium iodide is added to sodium chloride, iron deficiency or goiter has been almost completely eliminated. So like in the United States, when you buy table salt, typically it's ionized potato table salt, so there's this iodine in there. <coughs> so write the chemical formulas for each of the compounds listed above. Right. So we have potassium the compounds, the two compounds that are listed are potassium iodide and sodium chloride. The iodine is an ion so it doesn't fall into this category of a compound. So the two that are listed are potassium iodide and sodium chloride, as we said. Potassium iodide, potassium is K, iodine is I. Potassium, because of its location on the periodic table, is a plus one, iodine is a minus one, so it's just Ki. Sodium is Na and Cl. Again, alkaline metal, halogen. So those are the two formulas. Next, what is the <coughs> percent by mass of iodine in potassium iodide? Again, percent by mass is the mass of iodine over the total mass times 100. So in this case, the mass of iodine, we have one iodine. From the periodic table, the mass, atomic mass of iodine is 126.9. So this is going to be equal to 126.9 AMUs divided by the mass of iodine plus the mass of potassium from the periodic table, 39.10 times 100, gives us a, mass, or a percentage of 76.45%. <coughs> and the last question, the recommended daily allowance or RDA for iodine is 150 micrograms per day. How much potassium iodine should be consumed if we want to meet that RDA? If the RDA is 150 micrograms in every one day, we have to figure out how much iodine we need and then based on this percentage, that will let us know how, for how much iodine we have for the total mass we need. Right? So we want to go from micrograms to grams. So one microgram is one times 10 to the minus sixth grams. Again, that's one of the prefixes you need to have memorized. And from this percentage up here, we know that for every 76.45 grams of iodine, we need to consume 100 grams of Ki. Right. So again, multiply across the top, divide across the bottom, and we end up with 1.96 times 10 to the minus fourth grams of Ki per day. Right? So we don't need actually much iodine <coughs> to actually solve this problem. It's a fairly small mass, 1.96 times 10 to the minus 4th. <coughs>